very warm welcome to all of you for this call on Turkey's role in the Eastern Mediterranean, looking at the threats of conflict and the prospects for dialogue. My name is Mark Leonard. I'm the director of ECFR and very happy to welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Cullen, who is the spokesperson and senior advisor to the president of Turkey and is also an ECFR council member. I think that many people have been looking at the escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean for the last uh, few months with increasing anxiety. And we have seen this cycle of escalation putting uh, Turkey, Greece, Cyprus uh, and France uh, increasingly dangerous uh, loggerheads with each other over maritime boundaries and hydrocarbon resources. We have been working a lot on this at ECFR and have done a, a number of publications. Our Middle East and North Africa team led by Julian barnes Dacey, Asla Aydin Tashbash and other experts have been uh, working on it. And we're going to be looking at this issue from a number of different angles over the weeks and months ahead. But particularly happy today to give you the chance to, to listen to the view from Ankara on these issues. Ibrahim Cullin is uh, not just the spokesperson and advisor to the president of Turkey, but is uh, somebody who has played a very important part in thinking about Turkish grand strategy and, and great Turkish foreign policy for a long time. When I first met him in Ankara, he was telling me about the strategy of zero problems with neighbors. Um, I'm not sure how the events in the last few weeks uh, fit into that uh, grand strategy, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing your presentation on uh, how you see the, the situation in the Eastern Med, what prospects there are for de-escalating it, and also to hear about the, the latest developments in your mind. Um, a very warm welcome to you, uh, Dr. Cullen. We'll uh, get Dr. Cullen to speak for a few minutes on the record, and then he's happy to answer any questions from you afterwards. And when he's finished speaking, I'll uh, talk a bit more about how you can ask those questions, either by raising your hand virtually or, or writing in the chat box. If people really want to start populating the chat box, um, if questions occur to you, then that's that's wonderful. But without further ado, uh, Dr. Cullen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. And I want to thank the ECFR, ECFR for doing it's wonderful work, uh, not only in the Eastern Mediterranean, but on all global issues that are of concern to uh, all of us. Focusing on the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, let me just uh, reiterate our uh, uh, position in regards to what kind of role uh, we would like to see all players, in fact, play in the Eastern Mediterranean. As a NATO member, Turkey uh, plays a stabilizing role for the peace, uh, security and prosperity uh, of the Eastern Mediterranean. We have uh, the longest shore uh, to the Mediterranean uh, in the east uh, of uh, that historic uh, uh, sea, which has been analyzed by historians, as you know, uh, during the Middle Ages, the ancient times, as the hub of many ideas, commodities, and cultures. Uh, you know, people have traveled. Uh, uh, Mediterranean has been subject to a number of important studies, uh, most important of which was probably by Fernand Brodel, uh, who wrote all these wonderful books about the Mediterranean culture. I mentioned this uh, as, uh, as a side note because I believe we need uh, to revive the spirit of the Mediterranean again to address some of our issues. Sometimes emotions get in the way, sometimes facts are forgotten, sometimes perspectives uh, may, might be skewed uh, a little bit to... Uh, here to have a you know fair hearing uh, about uh, all these issues uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. As a NATO member, of course, what happens in the Eastern Mediterranean is of concern to us, not only uh, bilaterally, say vis-a-vis -vis Greece or the or Cyprus or uh, say Lebanon, uh, but uh, but as a whole because. Uh, Everything is so intertwined uh, today. What happens in Libya, for example, immediately affects uh, geopolitical uh, dynamics and, and, uh, uh, and factors uh, all over the place. And the same goes true for Egypt, same goes true for Palestine, for Syria, and of course, uh, Turkey and, uh, and, and, and Greece. Now, uh, in regards to speci more specifically about what happened over the last uh, couple of months, um, uh, with German mediation, um, we began uh, a number of talks uh, and negotiations with our Greek uh, neighbors uh, to resume exploratory talks. Uh, those who know what they are uh, will, uh, will know uh, that there's, there's this talks, exploratory talks began in fact in 2002 and we had 60 rounds of talks until 2016. 
The goal of those talks was to identify uh, uh, issues between Turkey and Greece, not only on uh, maritime limits, but also a number of other issues uh, in the Aegean, the islands, the airspace, uh, and a number of other uh, issues. In fact, uh, when exploratory talks uh, were going on, uh, we also had uh, two other tracks. Uh, one was uh, political consultations between uh, the foreign ministries of the two countries to address all bilateral issues, meaning economic issues, tourism, cultural issues, minorities, uh, the Western trace, the, the Turkish Muslim minority in, uh, in Greece and the Greek uh, community in Turkey, and all of these issues. And the third track, in addition to these islands and the political consultation issue, uh, is the military track, where the militaries talk to one another. When we began uh, this uh, round of talks, uh, most recently, uh, it was, uh, in fact, against the backdrop of the two meetings that our president and the Greek prime minister, uh, Mr. Mitsotakis, had first uh, in New York and then in London, um, where uh, they both agreed uh, twice to resume these talks. But for some reason, uh, they never took off. Uh, we were never able to, you know, get things in place to start uh, these talks. But as an important note, uh, again, I want to uh, underline that uh, the exploratory talks stopped in 2016 because the Chipras government at that time didn't uh, uh, feel ready or uh, uh, comfortable to continue with these talks uh, at that time for a number of uh, domestic political issues. So when we talk about resuming the exploratory talks between Turkey and Greece, we've been always there ready to uh, start these talks uh, again without any uh, preconditions. Uh, they've stopped over the last four years because of the domestic Greek political uh, situation. In the two meetings that President Erdogan and the Prime Minister Mitsotakis had in New York and London, the agreement was that we should start immediately. Uh, but it didn't happen, so the Germans uh, stepped in, provided their good services, good offices, and, uh, and we have been, I think, lucky and grateful to the Germans for, for doing this. Uh, of course, this round of talks, uh, negotiations with German mediation focused more specifically uh, on uh, the maritime issues and uh, hydrocarbon energy uh, activities uh, in the eastern Mediterranean. But uh, we should all remember uh, that Turkish-Greek relations cover a much wider range of issues, not just the uh, uh, delimitation of maritime boundaries, uh, but also all other issues that I mentioned, such as economic relations, tourism, the minorities, uh, uh, and uh, military relationship, uh, and of course, uh, this all within the, within the context of uh, NATO uh, alliance. In addition to that, uh, Turkey, uh, as a negotiating member uh, with the EU, has had good relationship. We only supported Turkey's uh, EU membership bid, uh, and in, in NATO also, we've been close uh, partners. But there have been tensions uh, recently uh, about uh, Eastern Mediterranean and who is going to do what, where, etc. Now, there's a long history uh, behind this. I don't want to burden you with that history, but sometimes I hear rather unfairly that Turkey is acting unilaterally, uh, aggressively. You put it more mildly when you said assertively or Turkey's assertive policy. Uh, but to be fair, uh, it was not Turkey that began uh, giving licenses uh, in either uh, the Eastern Mediterranean or around uh, Cyprus. Uh, it was, in fact, first the Greek Cypriots after they were... Uh, accepted into the EU as a full member in 2004 after they rejected the Anand plan that they began uh, giving licenses to a number of companies around the island in the areas which were disputed, uh, which completely denied the rights of the Turkish Cypriots. They signed a number of agreements starting in 2007 and continuing until 2015-16, a number of agreements with Egypt, with Lebanon, with Israel in total rejection and denial of the rights of the Turkish Cypriots. And then Greece began to uh, giving licenses to energy companies uh, after the 2010s, 2011, 12, 13, etc., uh, to a number of companies again uh, in violation of uh, Turkey's rights. The the, the fundamental logic uh, of uh, exploratory talks was to identify those issues and uh, work together in uh, what is considered to be disputed areas between Turkey and Greece. Uh, on the one hand, and between the Turkish Cypriot territories and the Greek Cypriot territories uh, on the other. And unfortunately, uh, 
some of the actions by either Greece or the Greek Cypriots uh, have gone uh, beyond uh, the uh, reasonable limits uh, of uh, maritime uh, boundaries in the Eastern Mediterranean. Now, uh, let me just end this part because uh, you asked me to provide more room and, and time for, for questions, and I think it will be uh, a more meaningful uh, to do so. But let me just uh, uh, make one point about the role of the EU uh, here. Uh, we have had uh, a number of talks and, and uh, meetings uh, with EU officials, uh, with Germany as the term presidency, and our president has had numerous phone calls with Chancellor Merkel, with EU President Michel. In fact, he will be speaking to him uh, in about 45 minutes. That's why I will have to take leave uh, around uh, 4.50 or so uh, to be present uh, in that call. Also, and our president had phone calls with the prime ministers of Italy, Spain, and, and other uh, EU leaders. The, the whole idea behind all this uh, is uh, uh, for EU to be uh, an honest broker here. That is, if you are going to deal with issues between Turkey and Greece, that must be uh, done on the basis of uh, equality, fairness, um, transparency. Uh, a union is more than a sum total uh, of its members. And the interests uh, of a union must be also more than a sum total uh, of the interests of its members. If you're going to talk about you know, the EU as a whole, uh, it cannot be uh, its interest or its vision, its uh, strategic outlook cannot be reduced uh, to only the perspective of one or two uh, members. Uh, it's no secret that there are some EU members that uh, uh, have issues with Turkey. And I will mention here France, for example, uh, with, with its attitude uh, over the last year or so, especially in regards to both Syria and Libya. And in our assessment, you know, countries like that are fighting another battle with Turkey, uh, but simply using the current crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean uh, to fuel more anti-Turkey uh, sentiment. And uh, it, it really doesn't do any good uh, to either resolving the issues at hand uh, or to uh, EU's image uh, as an honest broker or to Turkey-EU uh, relations. When uh, some members talk about sanctions, sanctioning Turkish economy or Turkish energy sector or companies, et cetera. Uh, look, you know, uh, we've seen that, we've been there, uh, we've been through all that. Uh, I think they should know, anyone who knows Turkey should know that, you know, those kind of sanctions or talks, uh, blackmailing, et cetera, will not, never work against Turkey. Um, we call for a fair, equitable, transparent process of negotiation in the Eastern Mediterranean. And we believe we can resolve these issues through negotiation. And our president has given a chance, a major chance by making a, a very major gesture, uh, 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 by uh, uh, giving a chance to uh, diplomacy again. We did this uh, about, uh, about two months ago in July, uh, but unfortunately the Greek side uh, came up with an agreement with uh, Egypt only a day before we were going to make a joint announcement to resume the exploratory talks. Things stopped because of that agreement because that process has not been transparent. Uh, we were not told about this. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, others in the EU have not been told about this. And uh, it certainly uh, undermined much of what we were able to achieve uh, up to that point. Uh, but now our president has given ch a chance to diplomacy again uh, Oruç Reis is back in the Antalya uh, dock, and I believe and I hope uh, the Greek side, uh, Greece especially, will use this as, a, as an opportunity to advance uh, the talks, uh, and uh, we will resume exploratory talks soon, and uh, this will be hopefully reflected positively at the EU summit uh, on September 24th and 25th, and uh, we want to see a new page turn uh, in uh, relations between Turkey and Greece, but also in relations in the relations between Turkey and EU. Thank you very much, Dr. Colin. Can I just ask you one uh, quick question before opening it up to, to um, the very distinguished people who are listening on the call? Um, when you talk about these negotiations, 
do you think how, how much of it is going to be about diplomacy? How much of this is going to be about international law in terms of coming up with a solution to, to the issues that we're facing? Well, the international maritime law or the convention suggests that, in fact, any dispute between two countries uh, on maritime issues should be addressed and resolved bilaterally first. If uh, those issues cannot be resolved bilaterally, then third parties, arbitration or other courts uh, can come in. But uh, let's also remember that these talks take a very, very long time. Russia and Norway negotiated for about 40 years to agree on their delimitation uh, of their maritime boundaries. Uh, France and, and the UK, I believe, negotiated more than 10 years, 12 years or so uh, to agree on uh, a maritime uh, delimitation. So there should not be an expectation of resolving these issues, uh, you know, uh, in, in, you know, in a few months or in a few years. I think we just have to be realistic. As I said, uh, the exploratory talks between Turkey and Greece lasted for 16 years, 14 years, sorry, began in 2012 and stopped in 2016. And uh, we had 60 rounds of talks. Uh, so, I mean, these things do take time. Okay. I've got lots more questions that I might drop in later on, but I uh, would like to give other people a chance to ask questions. Um, if you uh, can indicate your uh, willingness to ask a question, either by raising your hand if, if on the participants list, there's a raise hand function, or you can write questions in the Zoom chat. Um, and Carl Bilt was the, the first person who, uh, who caught my eye. So I'll go to Carl first, and then uh, we'll take it from there. Should we take them in groups of three? Is that, does that work for you, Ibrahim? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. No, Carl. you should hear me? Yes, loud and Okay. Oh, fine. No, I had some technical difficulties in the beginning, so I, there might be some words of wisdom that I missed, but uh, one remark and, and one question. One is the, the level of rhetoric uh, lately has been somewhat, in my opinion, exaggerated. Uh, you, you know, you need to comment upon this, but, but, but I think some of the rhetoric by your president in public meetings have been somewhat inflammatory. And as both you and I know, those are the things that capture the headlines. And those are the things that sort of drive a lot of the political debate. So I, I, I think that has contributed to the situation that we are in at the moment. The question is um, how to resolve these things. I've, I've been involved in trying to resolve it between Sweden and the then Soviet Union in the Baltic, where we had a dispute about the island of Gotland, how important that should be. Then we had another even more serious dispute, I would say, with Denmark. Denmark. Um, on a small island called Hessele, which was barely inhabited, what we should do with that one, and rhetoric was on a very high level. We did re resolve both of these, but it took some time. So I know the difficulties of how to count islands. Um, but one way of doing this is, of course, to leave it to international jurisdiction. Um, and one option here would, of course, be for an interim agreement and arrangement, and then leave it to, say, the International Court of Justice. That's going to take years because the issues are extremely complex in your case. More complex, I mean, the Norwegian-Russian thing was simple by comparison. Yours is difficult by any reason of a stand. It's going to take a long time. But that would sort of leave, have a mechanism for sorting it out long term, at the same time as you would have negotiations on the some interim uh, co-arrangement of, 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 of some sort. Thank you. Oh, well, sorry, yes, uh, groups of three, yeah. Uh, Great, thank you. Yeah. So the next person who uh, asked to speak was um, uh, Kunz. If you could introduce yourselves when you when you uh, ask the question as well. Eka, you're on, um, on mute. You're still on mute. Uh, Okay, Eckhart, you, you have to unmute yourself if you want to ask your question. Um, okay, now it should work. Thank you. Um, my name is Eckhart Kunz. I have been, I was ambassador in Ankara between 2006 and 2011. And kind regards uh, to Sayyid Ibrahim Kalin. We appreciate it very much. Uh, I found it most interesting how many international contacts took place because this is not really public meetings between President Erdogan and Mitsotakis and so on in London and New York and so on. Uh, so in the public opinion, 
in Germany, for instance, that this is not really obvious. But um, we have a public discussion here also, a most interesting article in Süddeutsche Zeitung by an um, expert on the international law of the seas. And she says, uh, she gives reason to Turkey in a, in a way. And she says, but why does Turkey not join the international convention on the law of the seas, which is the basis actually to go to a court. Now you're still on merely political context with uh, aspirations both sides, which are incompatible. Um, can't you go at least to have a common basis for uh, law questions? And maybe not to go to the International Court of Justice, but uh, to go to an arbitration court. That's also possible. And of course, if I might mention your role in Syria, and in Libya is also most important, is Eastern Mediterranean, and there should be much more discussion on it. Great, thank you very much. And there's a third question in this round from, uh, which came uh, um, in writing from Celia Richardson, who's a, uh, a, a senior UN official on, on Cyprus. Her question is from Turkey's perspective, could progress on resolving the Cyprus issue present an opportunity to diffuse regional tensions? And if so, how would Turkey see the way forward? Ibrahim, do you want to take those three and then we'll have another round afterwards? Yes, uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, Carl, thank you. It's good to see you, always to hear your words of wisdom and your experience in the negotiations with Russia. Uh, I'm sure you've had a taste of how difficult this uh, issues uh, can be. Uh, and uh, as you have pointed out, you know, our case is much more complex and sophisticated because of geography, because of the number of islands because of the proximity of the main uh, continents uh, and and all of that um so it's 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 not an easy issue but in principle of course you uh expect to uh, exhaust all possibilities bilaterally before you go to a third party this has been the understanding on both the greek and the turkish sides uh, over the last uh, several decades to resolve uh, these uh, issues uh international law or jurisdiction might be needed at some point but uh the, the, the logic of the exploratory talks and given the nature of the relationship between Turkey and Greece, uh, priority goes now to resolving these issues uh, bilaterally. And we are hoping that we will make uh, progress uh, on these issues. In regards to rhetoric, uh, well, um, I, I don't know uh, if you have been listening to the Greek uh, uh, public statements by Greek officials and politicians and, and people uh, at various levels of the government. Um, you know, I mean, they've been so fiery, inflammatory, when in fact we're, we had agreed in our meetings, in our uh, uh, confidential meetings, that we will lower the tension and we will avoid what we call statement diplomacy. You know, we will work, focus on the real uh, work uh, rather than, you know, making fire statements here and there. But unfortunately, the, our Greek colleagues and neighbors have not been very helpful. And they say they have a public opinion. Well, if Greece has a public opinion of 10 million people, you know, we have a public of 83 million. Uh, and uh, we, we, should, we should not start comparing, you know, these things. And I think uh, we've been very helpful and constructive uh, when the other side has been constructive. But I have to tell you this. Uh, uh, the Greek government decided to instrumentalize the EU against Turkey by mobilizing a number of EU uh, members uh, to talk about sanctions, pressure, uh, blackmailing, and the like against Turkey. This obviously could not have gone unnoticed and unanswered. Uh, and we have said this is not, this is not the right way. Uh, this puts actually the EU uh, in an awkward position uh, because now it is imprisoned by the interest and perspective of one single member. Uh, and EU should have a wider perspective. Uh, and shall, it shall not uh, be hostage to uh, the interests or perspective of one or two uh, member states out of uh, 27, 28 or nine countries. Uh, and this, um, we hope, uh, will no longer be the issue uh, here. Uh, that is, as we go, as we move forward now for further negotiations, EU sanctions, EU identity, the EU bloc, the EU front, should not be presented uh, as, uh, you know, as, 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 as a source of pressure or blackmailing against Turkey. It, it will not work. Uh, and as I said, it damages EU's position as an honest broker uh, here. Uh, 
In regards to uh, the international law of the sea, as, uh, as Ambassador Kunz uh, mentioned, as I said, uh, it will come when uh, we exhaust all possibilities between the two countries in this uh, negotiations, but in principle, we do not rule that out. And uh, you, you referred to Syri Turkey's role in Syria and Libya, and uh, I take it in the sense that, uh, you know, uh, Turkey has played an important role in Syria by taking almost 4 million refugees and stopped the refugee flow uh, to Europe. And we've played a, a, a constructive role and continue to play uh, uh, an important role in, in Libya. Um, and uh, you would like to see a similar position in the Eastern Mediterranean. That's been our perspective too. But, uh, you know, it takes the two to tango, e expecting Turkey to do everything. And then uh, other countries imposing their own agenda uh, is not the right way uh, of going around these international issues. As you know, as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an experienced diplomat, I mean, you know, you understand uh, how, how important to have the principle of equality and fairness uh, in, uh, in all of these issues. We have said all along that, uh, yeah, we see a lot of uh, accolades being given to Turkey for its work in regards to the Syrian uh, migrants. Fine, but it's not enough to just tap Turkey on the shoulder and say, you've done a great job, you know, keep doing this and uh, uh, you, you're going to have to deal with this problem anyway. When Turkey raises its voice over these issues, how about fair sharing? How about burden sharing? How about, you know, you doing something about this? How about helping us help the refugees? How about helping us help you in regards to the refugees or the terrorists or the stability in Syria and, and so on and so forth? Then Turkey is accused of being aggressive, uh, unilateral, uh, radical, and, and so on and so forth. It's simply uh, not, not fair. The same you know, can be said uh, in regards to Libya. Uh, uh, had it not been uh, for our uh, close work with the Tripoli government, uh, the government of national accord, uh, we know Haftar uh, will be running Libya today. And uh, who, who is running Haftar behind the scene? Do you think it will have been a, a good, reasonable, acceptable scenario for either EU or for NATO uh, if Haftar was to rule Libya right now, supported by the countries that we all know? I don't want to name names here, but we all know who is supporting uh, Haftar and what kind of a vision, political vision he has uh, in Libya. So Turkey, yes, uh, we went in there, we signed an agreement with the Sarraj government, and that uh, brought a degree of balance to the conflict in Libya. And thanks to that, now, uh, you know, we have uh, diplomacy moving forward. We have negotiations between Benghazi and, and Tripoli, and that's good. Yes, there are some internal issues at the moment. Saraj is uh, uh, considering resigning to allow the work of the, the councils, etc. Uh, nevertheless, you know, it has been a stabilizing force. In regards to the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, why not, you know, do the same uh, there? Uh, uh, have these negotiations uh, and take into account Turkey's concerns. I mean, for example, what is presented as a disputed area, as a contentious claim uh, is, if you look at the map and you mentioned that these meetings between the prime uh, president and prime minister Mitsotakis and other meetings were not fully registered in Germany, it's interesting. Uh, if you look at the map and I have the maps here, but I don't want to burden you with all of that. Just, you know, as a proof, I have the maps here, but I know it will be difficult to see, uh, but uh, experts can go and look at these maps. The island of Castellarizo is only two kilometers away from the Turkish mainland, and it's a 10 kilometer square kilometer island. It belongs to Greece. We recognize its sovereignty. It is a Greek island, but to claim 40,000 square kilometer maritime zone for an island of 10 square kilometers, only two kilometers away from the Turkish mainland and 580 kilometers away from the Greek mainland. Is that a fair or realistic demand? It's not. Everybody says that, no, this is a maximalist claim and that no country with a sound mind or no international body with a fair understanding of, of, of the geography at hand uh, will give credence uh, to this claim. Now, nobody talks to Greece about this, saying that, well, you, you're being very maximalist here. You know, if you apply this principle, that means that even the Turkish fishermen cannot go out, you know, five, six miles uh, up in the Antalya shore without uh, violating uh, your uh, maritime limits, without getting permits from you. 
when we uh, contest this issue and when we raise issues about this, then we are accused of being aggressive, unilateral, not cooperative. It's just simply not fair. Now, this brings me to the question of Cyprus, the, the, the third question. Uh, well, you, you all know the history of the Cyprus conflict. I mean, Carl is here. I think he was in office at that time and uh, many other experts know very well what happened in 2004 when the Anand plan was put to a vote. It was the Greek Cypriot side that rejected the Anand plan, not the Turkish side. And then what happened? The Greek side was accepted into EU as a full member. And the EU actually violated one of its core fundamental principles, meaning that you do not accept a country as a member when that country has a territorial dispute with another country. So when uh, the Greek Cypriot side of the island became a full uh, EU member with a voting right, uh, everything changed. And ever since then, the Turkish Cypriots have been under pressure, unfairly treated, subject to all kinds of sanctions. Uh, and when we raise this, this issue, uh, we are presented as the aggressive side. You know, I'm like, how come? I mean, how is that possible? It's the Greek side that rejected the Anand plan, but they were awarded. They were rewarded for their rejection of the UN peace plan uh, in Cyprus. Since then, we have had two major, major initiatives under the UN again. Most recently, a year and a half ago in Kranz Montana. And again, any, anybody who knows uh, anything about Cyprus negotiations, I think will agree with me uh, that it was the Greek side that rejected this plan again. Anastasiadis came out and said they are not ready to sign anything uh, under the UN. Uh, when in fact the UN officials, uh, Espen Aida and others knew, uh, know very well how much uh, effort we put uh, into resolving uh, this issue. It remains an unresolved issue, but unfortunately the Greek Cypriot side takes advantage of its EU membership uh, to put pressure on the Turkish Cypriot side uh, and take this very aggressive posturing. Great, thank you very much. So we'll have another round of, of, uh, of questions now. Um, Apostolos uh, Mangiaridis, Mangi, yeah. Anyway, um, hopefully you know who you are even if I screwed up the pronunciation of your name. Hello, Mark, and uh, hello to everyone. And hello, Dr. Kalin, do you hear me? Loud yes. So hello from Athens. Uh, Dr. Kalin, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to get a, a clarification. Uh, I'm a political correspondent for Sky Television in Athens. Um, I'm a little bit confused with what the Turkish government has decided with the research vessel or route race. And I would be really happy to get a clarification. Is the ship back to at the Antalya port due to maintenance reasons or will it be out to the water soon? What is the, what's the current state of play? Because we have uh, listen to some contradictory statements by the Turkish government officials. The, the the Secretary of State, the Foreign Minister said that it will be out very soon. And and then a while ago you just said that uh, it was a, a, a gesture, uh, a kind gesture from President Erdogan. So I would really love to get a clarification from you. Thank you very much. Great. And then the next in the list was John Soares. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to take part. Um, <clears throat> first of all, a, an observation and then a, a question. Uh, the, I, I was impressed um, by uh, Professor Carlin by the way in which you were urging the European Union to play a role in these issues. Um, I, I fear, though, that the European Union is now forever institutionally biased on the questions of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, not helped, of course, by our own national foolishness here in Britain uh, of, um, of, of leaving the EU. But because Greece and Cyprus are members of the EU and Turkey is not, it, it seems impossible for the EU to take uh, a balanced position uh, uh, on these issues. And I think working, my own observation would be that working with, um, <clears throat> uh, with Greece, which now has probably the best and most cooperative prime minister for the last 20 years, uh, and with the help of um, German mediation, which is remarkably uh, balanced and fair-minded compared to, say, the French uh, participation in that uh, in that region, uh, I, I think that would be a, a more fruitful way forward. <clears throat> My question is more about um, uh, to understand more clearly the uh, connections between the uh, maritime issues in the Eastern Mediterranean 
uh, and your um, intervention in Libya. Uh, I do understand the reasons for the interventions in Libya uh, without necessarily endorsing all that you say, uh, and certainly as a supporter of the UN process in uh, Libya, it's important that there's a balance between, at the very least, a balance between the two sides, and Turkey's contributed to that. But could you say a few words about what is the link uh, in your mind, the policy link between your intervention in Libya and the maritime issues of the Eastern Mediterranean? Great. And then the third question in this round is, is from Laura Patel. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes. Um, my question actually follows on from the question that Sir John just asked, because um, I wanted to ask a bit more about the geopolitics of the East Med issue. Um, you know, it's partly about gas, the conflict, but a lot of analysts think that it's also about power struggles. Um, and we know that there's a kind of power divide playing out between Turkey and Qatar on one side and um, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt on the other, and that's having consequences from Libya to Syria to the Gulf. You know, those trio of countries that I just mentioned see Turkey as a very destabilizing influence in the region. And I'd like to hear a bit about how Professor Cullen and how Turkey sees them and how much that's playing into all of this. I, should just, I forgot to say who I was, by the way, I'm the Turkey correspondent for the Financial Times. Right. And John Saws um, uh, is a former head of MI6 and a very senior diplomat in the British system, doing lots of jobs, um, as well as uh, um, working in Downing Street for a while. So um, who wants to go? Uh, yeah, for uh, Ibrahim, do you want to uh, do those three? And then hopefully we'll have one final round, one final round um, after that. If, uh, if Thank you. Uh, in, in, uh, in, re in regards to our friend's question from, uh, from Athens, uh, as uh, our foreign minister clarified yesterday, Oruç Reis now is in Antalya port for maintenance. It will be there, but this is an opportunity. And our president said that, look, this is an opportunity, as in fact, we had this opportunity before when he stopped the first Navtex uh, of the Oruç Reis back in July. Uh, and this should not be squandered uh, this time. And we hope that things will move forward uh, over the next couple of weeks until the EU summit and afterwards. Uh, and also, and uh, we will be in a position to resume exploratory talks. And we are hopeful. We believe the climate is conducive uh, to that uh, at the moment. Uh, we have... Uh, I think reached a, a good understanding in regards to what uh, steps uh, uh, we need to be taking uh, over the next uh, few weeks uh, to resume the talks. And once they begin the, the talks, uh, obviously they will uh, address all these issues and they will lower tensions and we will get rid of this high flying rhetoric and hopefully, uh, you know, and, uh, and we will focus on the real, uh, real work uh, here. And that is to address whatever issues are presented or thought to be or registered as disputed issues or areas between Turkey and Greece. Again, I want to underline um, that this is uh, a long process. Uh, no one should expect uh, a quick result, um, you know, over the next few weeks or few months. Uh, even after the German presidency is over, uh, you know, we should not get the idea that, okay, with the German presidency, you know, out of the picture, the things will go back you know, to this and that, it will take some time. Uh, that's why we need uh, political commitment. And I, I see that from both sides. Our president is committed to this and Prime Minister Mitsotakis uh, is committed to this. I mean, my counterpart in the Greek government, and we talk about this all the time. Uh, and uh, we, I believe with the German mediation and very constructive role they played, by the way, uh, during this process, uh, we will hopefully uh, uh, continue this uh, this process of negotiation and, and dialogue. Having said that, uh, the legal position of the two countries remain the same. Uh, negotiations, exploratory talks do not change fundamentally the legal positions that we have, but that's why we need the negotiations, right? We need to address uh, those issues bilaterally with mediation, with maybe participation of other third parties, but at the moment, uh, we would like to start this bilaterally uh, and, uh, and hope that it will create some uh, positive uh, momentum. In regards to uh, uh, Mr. Sower's question, yes, I think there is uh, a, an issue uh, there. Uh, how can EU be an honest broker and have a balanced position when uh, the countries we're talking about, Germany and, and Greece and others are in fact members of the European Union. I mean, they make up the Euro European uh, Union. 
I, I believe the German uh, mediation has been very helpful. Uh, they've been fair. Uh, uh, some other countries not involved in this direct negotiations have not been that helpful. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, France has not been very helpful. President Macron, you know, takes up issues with our president uh, here, uh, you know, every now and then. And I believe it's not about Eastern Mediterranean. It's more about Syria. It's more about Libya. And it's more about other uh, larger geopolitical uh, issues and maybe has something to do with the French domestic political uh, scene. That kind of grandstanding coming, uh, you know, from France and particularly from its president, uh, is not helpful uh, at all. Uh, our president has had many, many talks and conversations and meetings uh, with President Macron, and I think he should know uh, Turkey's position uh, on uh, uh, on all of these uh, uh, issues. Uh, in regards to uh, the connection between maritime limits and, and Libya, uh, in a sense, there is a connection because uh, we see Libya as part of the Eastern Mediterranean. And if there's going to be uh, a, a platform where all key members of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, participate and contribute to uh, peace and stability uh, and perhaps joint research of uh, hydrocarbon energy resources in the Eastern Mediterranean, that should include all the countries, Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Israel. Yes, we don't have good relations at the moment with Egypt and Israel. We have our political issues, but our president said, look, if there's going to be a, a fair, a, a comprehensive and inclusive uh, platform uh, to address all these energy issues, we are ready for it. Now, this issue, this idea is picking up uh, recently uh, uh, voiced by uh, uh, EU President uh, Michel and uh, Chancellor Merkel and, and others. Now, that, that's, that's a good, good sign uh, because uh, uh, those who know, again, will remember uh, that uh, uh, a number of countries in the Eastern Mediterranean, led by Greece and Greek Cypriots uh, and, and others, formed uh, an alliance uh, against Turkey, and they called it the East Med Gas Forum. Uh, and, uh, you know, strangely enough, they, they try to advance their uh, energy agenda by excluding Turkey, when in fact every expert in the field said and continues to say that it doesn't make any sense uh, to have any kind of energy map in the Eastern Mediterranean without Turkey. Even if you find any gas any, in any part of the Eastern Mediterranean, say between Cyprus and Israel or further south or further north, how can you even uh, transport this gas to Europe without Turkey? Uh, you will have to spend and invest billions of dollars. So it doesn't make any sense, you know, financially, but for uh, but because of political reasons. Now there is... Uh, more willingness uh, to have a, a wider and more inclusive uh, conference or perception or understanding of the Eastern Mediterranean uh, gas uh, resources. And uh, we welcome that. We will, uh, we will work with our partners uh, to, uh, uh, to move that agenda uh, forward. Um, the last question was about geopolitics of the Eastern Mediterranean. That's obviously the key issue here. I think all others, in a sense, uh, come under the umbrella of larger geopolitical uh, issues. And there, uh, there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, muscle flexing going on. Uh, there's a lot of political uh, grandstanding uh, going on. There are different alliances. You, you pointed to uh, some of them. Uh, and uh, uh, we believe some of those attempts uh, to impose uh, ideas and, and, and uh, perspectives coming from outside the region coming from outside the countries uh, in question have not been helpful at all. And they will not provide any incentive for more constructive engagement, whether it's in Syria, where it's in Il Libya, or in other parts of the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, this goes beyond energy uh, issues. Uh, Turkey is a key player there as a NATO member with, with a big country, with a big economy. Uh, any attempt by, say, the Emiratis uh, or France uh, or other countries uh, simply uh, rejecting Turkey uh, or acting as if they can do without uh, a player like Turkey is not going to produce any uh, constructive results. It will have a destabilizing impact in the entire region. 
Thank you very much, Ibrahim. We've got three minutes left and there are seven people who want to ask questions. So I apologize to everybody who I'm not going to have time to come to. And um, just to make sure that we get a couple more questions in, I might just read out a couple which came in. One question uh, from C.B. Goffman in Le Monde um, uh, is in the chat box. Has President Erdogan talked to President Trump recently? How do you see the U.S. position in this conflict between NATO members? Um, another question was about uh, President Macron's Pax Mediterranea uh, proposal. What do you um, think of that? There was a, a third question about the, the Treaty of Lausanne and whether it's still satisfactory for Turkey and whether it needs to be updated. Um, I think that's probably all we're going to have time for in the in the last three minutes. So I apologize profusely to people we haven't had a chance to come to, um, but maybe you can try and uh, answer those three in the three minutes that we have left. Uh, first, as a disclaimer, actually, I have to leave early in a few minutes uh, to attend a call between our president and uh, President Michel uh, of the EU um, to talk about the issues that we are talking about here. So, I mean, it's, it's quite relevant, so it's not something that is rather uh, luxurious, uh, you know, another event, but rather it's uh, directly related to what we have been discussing here. Uh, and the call is at five, so in 10 minutes, so I will have to leave. In regards to the U.S. position, uh, uh, as, uh, look, uh, in, in principle, uh, President Trump uh, uh, has had um, a rather constructive role uh, in calling for uh, de-escalation in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, our president and uh, Trump, President Trump had a call about two weeks ago uh, about these issues. But uh, we have raised uh, an issue with, uh, with the US government of, uh, in regards to the lifting of the arms embargo for the Greek Cypriot side uh, and the timing of it, the, the nature of it, the, uh, the extent of it uh, is not helpful at all. Uh, it violates the principle of balance and fairness uh, there when, in, when the Turkish uh, Cypriots are still under embargo, economic and otherwise, you lift the embargo for the Greek Cypriot. It doesn't really help the situation uh, on the island. That's number one. Number two, maybe a minor issue, but the fact that the U.S. Secretary recently visited only the Greek Cypriot side and not the Turkish Cypriot side uh, doesn't send really the right messages uh, of... Uh, being an honest broker for the U.S., uh, it, it reflects a very one-sided approach uh, to the whole issue at a time when we had these tensions in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, in regards to President Macron's uh, uh, Pax Mediterranean, sounds wonderful, and I hope he has the real ideas uh, to make it happen. Okay, thank you very much. I think we've come to the end of the allocated time. Um, I would like to uh, tell you for people who, oh, Lausanne, sorry, that's the final thing. Do you want to say something on that in the last few well, seconds? Lausanne is a historic treaty. It's, it's out there, uh, you know, with its ups and downs and pluses and minuses. Uh, it's, it's a binding uh, agreement. It's there. Okay. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Um, we will be coming back to this topic again. We will organize another call with some uh, perspectives from different EU member states, which we will uh, invite you to as well. Um, I also, as we leave, just want to remind you of the, the Deep Sea Rivals project, which our Middle East and North Africa program has been conducted, which I mentioned at the beginning. We'll send a link to some of the papers that come out of that. This is a, a really big focus for our, for our program, and we'll carry on looking at it. Wish you all the best for your call with President Michel and thank, thank you. everybody for, for joining us. We'll be back in touch very soon. Goodbye. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Bye.